Our next speaker is Marla Valentine from Old Dominion University. All right, good morning, everybody. So this morning, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the role of sponge functional diversity and how this affects many ecosystem functions provided by these diverse and dense communities in South Florida. So it's traditionally thought that while sponges or filter feeders in general are, are diverse, there's many different species, they're filter feeders. So they're all considered functionally redundant. But the question is, is this true for sponges? Does it follow that rule? Well, as Mark has already mentioned, they have a variety of ecosystem functions. They're habitat engineers, they're habitat for lobsters, they're sound producers, and most importantly, they play a big role in benthopelagic coupling. So they have these very complex relationships with bacteria. They have bacteria, archaea, fungi, all sorts of microbial communities living within the interstices of their tissues. And this can have um, some pretty strong implications for how they affect their local environment. So we have sponges that are high microbial abundance. They have lots and lots of bacteria in their tissues. And then we have sponges that are low microbial abundance. They have very few bacteria in their tissues. And each sponge species has a very unique community. So the question is, are all these sponges functionally redundant in how they affect their local environment? And if you just saw Mark's fabulous talk, you already know the answer to that question. So one of the chapters in my dissertation focused on determining how varying levels of sponge diversity, density, and local environmental conditions, especially current velocity, affects ecosystem function. So we're not focusing on one small little sponge in an aquarium. We're focusing on communities of different biomasses in different tidal regimes to see how they are generally affecting the environment around them. So I selected 10 species of sponges for this experiment and I wanted a wide variety of functional traits. So I selected sponges that were both high microbial abundance and low microbial abundance had terminal biomasses that were either small, so about the size of a golf ball, or large, so around the size of a truck tire, sponges of variety morphologies, so vases, balls, branchings, volcanoes, and then sponges with different life histories, so ones that are very sparse and slow growing or those that are weedy. So again, as I mentioned, rather than focus on some poor little sponge in an aquarium, I built these very complex bloom systems because I wanted to create a sort of natural environment in which water moved across a field of sponges so that we could get the effect of an entire community on the um, ecosystem properties. So I built these so that water would come in through three in-current valves, hit this honeycomb-like baffle system, and be diffused across the entirety of the tank. And to keep water from recirculating so that sponges would refilter it multiple times, I built this ramp exiting the tanks so that water would gently flow out of the tank without recirculating. And then almost as if you're at your local pub, I built a tap system at the back of the tank so that I could collect water at the end of this experiment. And these are quite large just for perspective. They're about eight feet in length and several, about two and a half feet across. So they're they're quite sizable. Um, so we set these up in Long Key in Florida with in current coming in off of uh, Florida Bay. So we've got natural seawater. This is about what the tank setup looked like. So we had six tanks um, all set up. So each day I went out and collected um, approximately 200 sponges for these experiments and it took about 24 hours to get this set up and have the sponges acclimated. So there was a lot of scrubbing of detritus off of bricks and removal of creatures like octopus and crabs and lobsters that were living inside or around these sponges that hitchhiked into my experiments. So in terms of treatment groups, I had 10 species that I used in monocultures, and each of these were repeated at high and low biomass. And then I had polycultures using those two species, so groups of two, three, four, and 10 species. And again, all of these were repeated at high and low biomass and high and low current velocity. And my response variables that I looked at were dissolved organic carbon, chlorophyll A, nitrites, nitrates, ammoniums, phosphates, 
bacteria and viral like particles. So just to quickly do the math of what we're looking at here, that's over 140 treatment groups in one little experiment. So it was, it was quite massive, this project. So just to quickly delve into some of this data, we're going to look at the removal of some of these sponges um, as, as a group. So all sponges sum together. If we look at high biomass, low current velocity, this is where we see the largest removal of chlorophyll A across all sponge species. We see the same effect for ammonium removal. Again, high biomass, low current velocity. Now, this didn't matter at DOC removal. It didn't matter which biomass we're looking at or current velocity. Removal was similar across all of our treatments. But when we go to production of nitrites and nitrates, we see, again, um, the largest quantity. I messed up this one here, but mostly at high biomass, um, low current velocity. Same thing with phosphate production, high, um, high biomass, low current velocity. So again, for all treatment groups, high biomass, low current velocity had the statistically greatest effect on response variables with the exception of dissolved organic carbon. But if we want to look at it by species, we look, see the greatest chlorophyll A removal by Hippospongia lachni. That's the sheep's wool sponge. It is a common commercial bath sponge. It's about medium sized, black. It's a uh, sheep's wool. It's quite a soft sponge. And if we look at ammonium removal, again, Hippospongia lachni is our most important species. But then when we look at DOC removal, far and away, the species that has the largest effect is um, a species of Ursinia. This is a brown branching sponge. If we look at nitrate nitrite production, the most production is by a LMA sponge. This is Tethiateca crypta. Um, and then the largest amount of phosphate removal is by Nyphades erecta, another LMA sponge. So to look at bacteria removal, we see about 25 bacteria particles per 10 to the 8 milliliters of water. But when you start looking at sponge uh, removal, so the base sponge, this is Arsenia campana, we see a near half reduction in the quantity of bacteria in the water column. Similarly for Arsenia sp, that's that brown branching sponge, and uh, Specius spongia vesparium, that's our loggerhead sponge. So all three of these are HMA sponges, and they're cutting the amount of bacteria in the water column by about half. But then we look at two LMA sponges. This is the golf ball sponge and um, the volcano sponge, Tethiateca crypta. We can see that reduction of bacteria by these two LMA sponges is by about a third. And this makes sense because they, these LMA sponges tend to utilize a larger uh, size particle when they feed. And then we look at those high diversity treatments where we include 10 species. We see almost all of the bacteria removed from the water column, which is which is pretty impressive. Um, so again, high species specific effects, high diversity, we see greater removal than LMA sponges, and LMA sponges greater removal than HMA sponges. So if all these sponges are functionally redundant, and we looked at a heat map, we would expect them to all have, all have the same strength of effect. They all have the same effect on chlorophyll A, they all have the same effect on ammonium. But what we're actually finding is this is not the case. So the effects of these sponges are very idiosyncratic and depends upon the response variable that we're looking at. So if we think about Mark's restoration project that he mentioned, if what we're focusing on most is the removal of chlorophyll A, perhaps we should restore vase sponges to the area. Or we want um, the greatest amount of bacterial removal. Well, then we might want to add in some of these LMA sponges. So this has some pretty strong implications for restoration. We want to restore not just habitat for lobsters and these, these sniferous communities, as Mark mentioned, we want to also have strong communities to affect the nutrient cycles in these areas. So in summary, species identity matters, but it's dependent on the parameter we're looking at. Um, high diversity, high biomass, and low flow, low current velocity environments is where we see the greatest change in our response variables. And while we are seeing some synergistic effects in short-term feeding trials, some evidence that we have in um, other experiments show that these sponges are potentially competing for food. 
So while diversity may be important, um, there are some other in emergent effects that we need to, to analyze before we begin these large restoration experiments. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank our funding agencies who um, have made all this work possible, as well as everyone that um, assisted in the field. Good.